biggest mistake I ever made in security. Go. The biggest mistake I ever made was thinking that a departing employee was the end of our program. And I realized that no matter how integral he was to the program, his replacement turned out to be a lot better. You're listening to CISO Series Podcast, recorded in front of a live audience in Florida. Welcome, everybody, to the CISO Series Podcast. My name is David Spark. We are recording live in Boca Raton at the Boca Raton Innovation Campus. All right. We, uh, I'm very, very excited uh, about the show. Let me first, though, mention my co-host, my co-host who, who, who has jumped in at the last minute because our, our previous co-host, unfortunately, uh, caught COVID, could not be here, but this gentleman swooped in. It is none other than the global head of cybersecurity for the TTI group. Big round of applause for Eduardo Ortiz right here. Hello, hello. Hola, 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 South Florida. So... Thank you very much. I am David Spark, the producer of the CISO series. And let me mention our spectacular sponsors for the CISO series. That would be Savvy Security, Quadrant Information Security, and Fortra, all sponsors of this very episode. And we are at the South Florida ISSA Hack the Flag conference. And there's a competition going on in the other room. We're doing the show in here. We're very excited to be here. And uh, it's just been a blast to be here. Now, here's the coolest thing. And I posted this on LinkedIn and it got a lot of cred. And these are these awesome badges, which are five and a half floppy disks. And there is actually something on some of these. Do you can does yours say anything on the other side? What does yours say? It says verbatim, but on the other verbatim. side, it looks, no. But on the other side, does it say anything? Oh no, those are just stickers you put on. Empty one. All right, I'm going to bring in our guest here. I'm going to ask if he he has anything. It's Adam Fletcher, CISO of Blackstone. Let's hear it for Adam. <laughs> Adam, is there anything, any sort of software identification on your floppy? Did you see? I got here too late. No badges left. Oh, they none left. Oh, so he doesn't get one. Well, they now the story I heard is. They bought 300 of these online for about 200 bucks. So I feel that the $200 was to pay someone to hoard these for three decades, <laughs> pretty much. Because <laughs> what else would you do with these things? No, these have got to be more than three decades old. I mean, these are old, very, very old. All right. What do you say, guys, we start a show here? Huh? We're going to do this? Let's yeah. go. It's time to measure the risk. Where is our biggest risk blind spot as an industry in cybersecurity? Is it cloud security? Now, according to a Bitdefender survey, only 45% conduct regular cloud security audits. Another stat I found quite shocking was that, get ready for this, 85% of security professionals believed their colleagues, that mean other people in the security department, could spot deep fakes. Yet, get ready for this, at the same time, nearly 97% said new Gen AI tools pose a threat to the organization. So how do we bridge the hubris of thinking our security department can spot faked videos with the universal realization AI tools represent a significant risk? I'm going to start with you, Eduardo. I mean, it's, I guess it's good that people have confidence in their teams, but that seems like a massive blind spot. Yes, but but for example, in our case, we are focusing on education and awareness, but also mostly for these specific cases on internal processes, right? If the process can be broken by a threat actor that managed to deepfake one of our employees to make a payment or make a different move, then the, the problem is on us, right? It's not about how much, I, I'm not a pretending to have employees that are expert spotting this, because I cannot pretend an accountant or a finance director to be an expert spotting deep fakes, but it's more about our internal processes. We were victim already, pretending to be our CEO in one of our subsidiaries in Mexico, and the internal processes actually catch up the threat actor. It was a deep fake that came through WhatsApp. So it's, it's, I've it's, heard, by the way, I spoke to someone who's a CISO at a big pharmaceutical. They said they were getting 10 deep fakes a month. 
yeah. through WhatsApp. I'm amazed that that much is happening. We, we were getting probably four a month, like one, one per week. That's, that's amazing that much this early. Adam, what do you think of this sort of split between, oh, we can spot deep fakes to we know this is a massive problem? Well, I think I'll challenge the premise here and say that deep fakes are only one of several potential threats that Gen AI presents. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. Right. So, you know, maybe you need to separate the two because you would need to ask what percentage of security professionals believe that their colleagues could spot an AI generated phishing email? What percent could uh, prevent data loss, you know, due to the use of Gen AI websites, right? There are a lot of risks out there. So I think both of these could be true. Good point. So actually, interesting thing, we brought this up on an earlier episode that we did at the uh, Convene conference almost a year ago. And that is, and something I realized is that a lot of us have a lot of audio and video of us on the internet. And some businesses and families recommend having a password, so if you see a fake video or fake audio, make sure there's some verbal password that never is communicated digitally, but just personally, have you guys done something like that? I haven't personally. I mean, my children are eight and six. I'm not sure they'd remember the password to tell <laughs> it to the alleged kidnapper. <laughs> uh, however, uh, I, I am aware of an executive who had this happen to his college age daughter, and that was the advice that I gave him. But this is, I mean, just for families and also businesses, yeah. I mean, it, it's a way to break the, the digital chain, essentially. Sure. Any experience with this? Yeah, we, we do have a code in our family. I'm not going to say which one it is. Yes, but obviously. We do are actually thinking about doing it with our executives in terms of a, a code word to validate specific high-level transactions or cases like this. What's broken about cybersecurity hiring? All right, there are a lot of people at this event that are looking for a job in cybersecurity. And I want everybody to strap in for this quote. Get ready for it. It's by Mike Merritt of an organization called Merit Based. Quote, there is no talent shortage. Never was. You can check to see the first place that rumor started, and it was industry certifications, vendors, and schools. But companies don't want skilled candidates either because they don't want to pay for them. What we're seeing in the industry today are companies pretending their security focus and advertising roles they never plan to fill. So they can convince their current overworked employees that they're trying while telling their board they can't find the right skills. Any company that is actually interested in addressing their risks and securing their company is having no difficulty at all finding the people to do it. Now, I want to thank Rachel Bicknell of Dell for posting this and Brian Thompson of PNC for recommending it. All right, I'm going to start with you, Adam, on this simple question. Do you agree or disagree with Mike Merritt's statement about the cyber talent shortage? Disagree. Disagree. All right. Walk me through because there's some interesting arguments made here. Well, first of all, I, I don't think that there's anybody out there posting jobs that they're never going to fill to try to present an image that they're security focused. I don't see how that would really benefit anybody. Secondary, well, no, 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 and again, I'm only playing devil's advocate sure. here. Well, maybe a CISO trying to prove I'm trying to do my job here. I'm trying to get these positions filled, but hey, nobody's applying. We haven't found somebody qualified. What would you say to that? Still disagree. I think that number one, most CISOs have to go through really hard processes just to get a job posted in the first place. I mean, the position has to be open. HR has to sign off on the job posting. It's got to be put in a whole bunch of different places. I just don't think that that's really the case. Now, if the CISO has decided that the requirements for the role are really narrow, then sure, it might be hard to find the right person. If, you, if you're talking about skill set, location, years of experience, all of those things, maybe you need to be more open-minded to find the right people. But I think there are people to be found. I mean, this person's definitely jaded about the hiring system. And if you believe this sort of conspiracy theory that they're all sort of in cahoots to sort of suppress the hiring of security professionals, 
maybe. I don't know. What do you think here, Eduardo? So, so I agree with Adam 100%. I haven't met a single company that will post a position just to post it. I mean, you have to go through, first of all, this, the approval of the position, the finance aspect of the position, if you're doing it the right way for travel and expenses, the certifications and education. So, so it's a long process just to get one position open and posted, and it has to be approved by the executive team. So I, I disagree that I don't think there's a talent shortage either. I, I, I agree on that, but the rest of it, I, I haven't met a single company that, that does it that way. It, but, it will be counterproductive. Let me ask you, are the two of you struggling to find talent? No, you're not? Not in our case. We have struggled in some cases due to location preference and the amount of time that we ask people to be in the office. Mm -hmm. I think that's a trend that specifically in cyber, specifically with technical talent, has started to reduce the available pool of people in different localities. But it doesn't mean that we were unable to hire. It just means it took longer. Yes. About the discussion of number of days in the office, how often did you have that conversation prior to the pandemic? Zero. 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 And now it's, is it every discussion? I don't think it's every discussion. There are some people who feel like they should be able to work remote all of the time. There are some people who really like the idea of being in the office and learning from their colleagues and being, let's say, in a sock where there's a dozen people and they're all back to back, you know, and they can talk about things just in real time by turning their chairs around. But there are also people in certain roles, like, let's say, pen testers, who just want to sit at home and do as much work as they possibly can and don't want to be bothered by coming into the office. So here's, here's my argument. I was just thinking, like, I have a friend, uh, son, who's in his early 20s, and he's working from home and he hates it. And I think about myself when I was in my early 20s and I worked in an office. And that was key for socialization and also for education. My feeling is if the 20-somethings don't have seasoned professionals in the office educating them, we're all going to be in trouble in about 10 years. Eduardo? Yes. I, in our case, we're very flexible about it. But surprisingly enough, most of our teams want to be in the office at least two or three days a week. We don't force it. We offer a really good culture, a really good office environment. People, I mean, it's really very inclusive, very open. So, so we kind of got ahead of the, of the problem and say, hey, we're going to be flexible. It goes by department, but we feel for, for our security teams, it's important that that integration of the team. We have, you know, our biggest team, which is in Milwaukee. Every other Wednesday, they play backdoors and breaches mm -hmm. in order to, and they have lunch together. So they discover situations about our own infrastructure that, oh, we never thought about that one. So it, it has become a really good social event for them, and now they're super integrated on it. What about, are you forcing a number of days in the office? Because also, my fear is the only the two, three days. Like, there are going to be a lot of days it's going to be sort of empty. And it's people are feeling like, oh, why the heck did I come in today? It's true. We, we, we have a minimum requirement. It's based on your function in the organization, your level in the organization. I'm in the office. If I'm in town, I'm in the office five days a week. And I would just add that, when we were all growing up, people of a certain age and seniority were all growing up, one of the things that always got talked about was you know, water cooler talk, right? Water cooler talk helps you develop as a professional. And if you're not in person and you don't figure out a way to force that over Zoom, it never happens. Who's our sponsor this week? We have three phenomenal sponsors on today's show, and I'm going to tell you about one of them each at a time. And first is Quadrant Security. They are bad news for bad dudes. Quadrant's XDR and advisory solutions combine the best people, the processes, and the technology managing your security so you can manage business operations. Providing continuous detection and response from their 24 by 7 by 365 U.S.-based security operations center. Now, Quadrant fortifies your front line to prevent, detect, and respond to real threats in real time. Now, for a limited time, Quadrant is offering organizations a free dark web report. 
detailing available data on the dark web that is leaving you vulnerable. I've actually had one of these done before. You should definitely check these out if you haven't seen what they know about you on the dark web. So to learn more and receive your free dark web report for your organization, visit quadrantsec.com slash dark web. That's Q-U-A-D-R-A-N-T-S-E-C dot com slash dark web. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, it's time for What's Worse. This is, hands down, the favorite game from our audience. We have been playing this game really since the beginning we launched this show. Here it is. It's, it's essentially a risk management exercise. There's two horrible scenarios. You won't like either one of them, Adam and Eduardo, but you have to pick. Which one? And we get these sent in from our audience. So I say to you, audience, send me some more. A good what's worse scenario are equally crappy. So here we go. Let's see. Sometimes, you know, our, our guests say, oh, this one's easy to pick. But we'll see if this one's easier or, or equally crappy. It comes from John Helt of Accenture Federal Services. And here is his scenario. The first, your IT staff are sick to death of receiving phishing awareness emails. So what's worse? Two scenarios. And by the way, Eduardo, since you are my co-host, you get to answer first here. All right. Scenario number one, all IT staff use email rules to automatically identify, report, and delete your company's phishing awareness emails on arrival. All right. So you paid for some phishing awareness tool and it's all getting deleted immediately. Got it? Yep. Scenario number two, your entire IT staff report Every single external email they receive is phishing. Which scenario is worse? I will have to go with number one. Okay. Um, Why is that one worse? Because it's breaking the rules for, for the organization, right? Like, like, hey, you have to go through it. You're part of our, our core IT group. So you're, you're part of the population. So if we allow them to break the rules, then every other department is going to say, hey, I, I want those same rules applied to me. Well, uh, it sounds like they do this for every email in the whole organization. So it's not just their department. They're doing the whole organization. Well, then that's worse. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely okay. even worse. And worse. Uh, and I, I'm doubling on, doubling double, down. on, okay, on but, one. But uh, hold on. I'm just going to argue the second scenario. The all IT staff report every single external email. So that's all emails for the whole organization are being reported as phishing. That's going to drown the security department. Uh, if we automate it with something called AI or something like that, we, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can get by. Is that how you're doing it right now? Well, we do have a lot of automation and, okay. and, and kind of like eliminate a lot of the noise. Right. All right. I'm throwing this one to you, Adam. Do you agree or disagree? Which one's worse here? When you clarified that the IT department was implementing those rules for everybody, then, yeah, I think that's worse. Then nobody gets any type of training. And although I don't put a lot of stock in awareness training for phishing, I mean, phishing click rates can vacillate from less than a quarter of a percent to, you know, 10%, and, and training is important. I think, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth and you still have to have good layered defense and good technical controls to prevent an incident, so. I have to say the same. I, I, we don't put a lot of emphasis on phishing tests. Okay, but you know, I just want to point that, I mean, the, the idea is that the IT staff reports every single email. Like, you can do some automation, but you still have to review some of these emails. Uh, we'll sit down with the CIO and kind of like, hey, your uh, people are doing <laughs> this. You know, they're creating a lot of work for us. So you want us to be bad? You think you can still function, Adam, in a scenario like that? I think you can still function. I think you would find, you would find it easier to, for the SOC to figure out how to filter through every external email gets reported and figure out where the ones that are malicious are, then nobody ever gets training. So here's my question to the audience. They, they think the first scenario of all IT staff use email rules to automatically identify, report, and delete your company's phishing awareness emails is on arrival is the worst. And the second being that every single email gets reported as a phishing email. So a by applause, all deleted is worse. How many people think that's worse? All right, that's a good that's a good amount. And then by applause, how many people think 
that reporting every single email is worse. A little bit lighter, but I, in general, the audience agrees with you. Thank you. What is Dave's mom talking about? All right. This is, this is a new favorite game we've been playing lately. And uh, it has to do with my mom, who is not a security expert. I know that comes as a shock to many of you. But my mother, an elderly woman who loves her son and is a good sport, really is what it is. So I interviewed my mother on different terms in cybersecurity. And you are going to try to guess what the heck she's talking about. Now, if they fail, I throw it to the audience. All right? So I'm going to play. I interviewed my mom about these terms. Some of them she kind of kind of figures out. Most of them she does not. But understand, if you were seeing this term for the first time, how would you try to describe it is best. So let's play the first one, see if you can guess what this is. Someone's going into your information, or they're trying to get you to sign up so they can get your information. Eduardo, what is my mother talking about? I think she's talking about a scammer and somebody trying to get to her either via, knowing that it's your mom, it's probably via a phone call. My mother does use a computer, Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's say she's using, uh, you know, Windows 98 or Windows no, XP on her computer. <laughs> you know, there's going to be, there's going to be a factor. I thought it was the phone. So let's move to the computer still thinking that she's probably getting, You're trying getting to get close. scammed or get fish by fish, somebody. there you yeah. go. Correct answer. It is fishing. Hooray! Good job. All right. We're going to go to you. All right. You're going to get this second one. That was the easy one. I just want to point out that was the easy Thank one. Thank you. Here we go. Adam, you're going to try to guess this one. You have to have a plan to avoid people messing up your system in the future. What is my mother talking about? And it's not as easy as Eduardo's. Business continuity? No, but avoid people. That's a good guess. But no, you want to take a guess at this one? Not business continuity. I thought about more of disaster recovery and somebody just making sure that you're testing your systems before they get messed up. You're, you're getting closer. I'm going to play this again for the audience and see if an audience member can get this. You have to have a plan to avoid people messing up your system in the future. All right. This woman over here thinks she knows the answer. Yell it out really loud. What do you think? I'm going to go with maybe policies. Policies? No. Anyone else? You can just shout them out. Just shout them. Hold on. What, no, not everybody at once. Okay. What would you say? Contingency plan? No, not contingency. What would you say? Security, Security plan. plan. No? Resiliency. No. You are extremely close. You are extremely close. Anyone else want to guess? Mediation. No, not that. Hold on, wait, what'd you say? I'm going to give it to you, intrusion prevention system. All right, let's hear it for you. Wow. Very good, very good. All right, here we go. We have two more to play. Let's see. And by the way, everyone knows these terms. I can't stress that enough. Avoiding the things that your mother told you not to do. What is she talking about, Eduardo? Ah, whoa. <laughs> and again, I don't, she, I don't she think... heard this term for the very first time, and this is what she thinks it is. Uh, I don't think this is even cyber-related, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, no. She, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Come on. Um, <laughs> so, uh, whoa. Okay, so just follow instructions and uh, talking about processes and making sure you're doing the right things at work. Yeah, well, it's a term in, in the industry. That's not a term. Come I would on. say that's her definition for security policy. No. All right, I'm throwing this to the audience. Okay, what do you think it is? No pop-up system. No? It's a term everybody here knows. That's, that's your huge giveaway. Compliance. What? Compliance. What? No, security plan compliance, no. Cyber hygiene. Cyber hygiene, no, but a good guess. Governance. No, not governance. Guys, it's zero trust. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody that, knows what that means. <laughs> There's like 20 definitions of zero trust. So, yeah, so. We're all confused by this. All right, the very last one. Here we go. A nickname that you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell anybody. A nickname you wouldn't be... Now, I'll give you a hint. Somebody yelled out the... Not exactly, but an answer very similar. Nickname you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell anybody. So are we talking about... 
what we were saying before about security codes or having a, a you know like a valid code to identify yourself uh, double down well, on the nickname part it's kind of a little part of the answer there what do you think alias uh, what an alias no not alias that's a little bit it's only a little bit of a hint anyone want to take a guess at this see no <laughs> what do you think super user? not super user no you wouldn't be embarrassed to have a super <laughs> user yeah here i'll play it again a nickname that you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell anybody Anyone want to try this one? It's tough. This one's the hardest one. I'll be, I'll be audience. CISO? No. CISO. <laughs> Very good. I was going to say CIO, but, you know. <laughs> Any? Token? Token? No. No. All right. Well, you're all going to. It's password hygiene, everybody. Mm. Oh, come on. Could have gotten that. All right, we t we we landed on such a down note. I didn't want to land like that. I know that's a hard one. <laughs> All right, well, again, obviously you don't know my mother that well. All right. Who's our sponsor this week? So I have a question for all of you: Are you trying to complete your identity access management? or I am strategy, but feel like you're working on a puzzle with missing pieces. You're not alone. And that is exactly where Savvy Security steps in. Their zero touch integrations fill those critical gaps, providing a complete view of your SaaS landscape. Now by leveraging existing client side sessions, Savvy automatically discovers, manages, and integrates all of your apps sanctioned or unsanctioned with no manual server side work needed. So you can quickly address issues like SSO bypass, unmanaged privilege access, dormant accounts, rogue tenants, and more. With Savvy Security, say goodbye to missing puzzle pieces and hello to a seamless identity first security strategy. Take control of your SaaS environment today. We've all got one. And you will be surprised at how run amuck it is, for that matter. So you can learn more about this. You just go to their website, Savvy Security's website, easy to find, savvy.security. For those of you who don't know how to spell savvy, it's got two V's in it. S-A-V-V-Y dot security. Go there and learn more. Surprising research just in. So a high profile cyber attack can result in financial loss, reputational damage and loss of customers. Those are the classic things. But there's another point of suffering. Yay. And that's the psychological harm to your own team. That's underreported, according to the recent research from the University of Kent and the UK's Royal United Services Institute. There is a psychological impact of a ransomware attack, and that needs to form part of an incident response plan. This could be budgeting for mental health support, creating a rotation schedule to avoiding burnout during an incident. We've actually talked a lot about this. And avoiding over-reliance on individual on individual staff members. Doing so will improve overall resilience and long-term staff retention. All right, I'll start with you, Eduardo. Have you ever managed this with your instant response plans? Because it seems like a doozy. I mean, first of all, before you, you say, yes, we have, or I'm, I'm gonna assume you have, but like, what is the psychological effects you've seen in your staff? So, so we do address this. In my previous company, we were the victim of ransomware in 2019. We had three people in the hospital within a few days, and it was oh mostly yeah, it it was panic attacks, right? And it was people that were not even in our security team, but they were IT support people because they thought, based on the incident that happened, and we recover, we we did everything right, and and we were actually pretty good, but. They felt like this happened because it was their fault, because they felt like, oh, I didn't do this thing or, you know, whatever it was, and, and it was really not their fault, right? But they felt so guilty about it that they went into panic attacks. We have two hospital, one that took leave. They were not related to the security team. But after that, in, in you know, my current role, we do implement that even in our tabletop exercises, just to make sure that we review those steps. 
We do it in our incident response plans. We actually have rotations, and we don't go the full eight hours. We try to go six hours and then take a break. And we do have the mental side of it in terms of a, if we need support, we have talked to HR. We're going to need these services just in case. We actually take that very seriously now after what happened from a personal experience. I agree with that. I, I, I heard from other teams that have been involved in these cases. There's always a victim, and it's a silent problem that nobody really wants to well, talk and, about. And it can have physical, you know, you know, like the panic attack. We, we've actually interviewed Tim Brown of SolarWinds before, and he lost 30 pounds in 30 days, 100% from stress after that SolarWinds incident. I gained 30 pounds in two days. but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adam, I throw this to you. How have you seen this manifest itself? I, I haven't seen it manifest in an incident response plan per se. I don't think we or anyone that I know has really written down, these are how shifts are going to work. These are the pizza places you should be ordering from every six hours. This is where people are going to sleep, when people are going to sleep, exercise, do whatever, shower for that matter. But I do think that in CISO circles, there's pretty significant awareness. There are a lot of people who have been out there talking about their experience in a severe incident. And I think there's there's pretty good awareness with many of the people that I would call peers and friends nowadays that this is one of the first things that has to get set up if you actually do go into full kind of wartime incident response mode, figuring out what those shifts are, when people are going to sleep, when people are going to eat, making sure that people are taking care of themselves during that incident response. I think there's there's a hero mentality when that switch gets turned on and everybody wants to work 24 hours, including the CISO, by the way. You know, everybody wants to be present working 24 hours, you know, a day, but it's just not rational or possible. Unexpected outcomes or failures. So now that we've got some distance from the crowd strike outage, what lessons have we learned from it? If nothing else, the incident showed that far too many organizations made the company a single point of failure, whether they knew it or not, argued Christopher Burgess in a CSO online piece. So is the key to shore up our disaster recovery and business continuity plans, because that's kind of like the last sort of wall of defense, if you will, but what about if you're in crowd strikes position, how do you do DR and BC planning for your customers and partners? I'm going to throw this first to you, Adam. There's kind of two ways of looking at it. Like, how do you predict all these possible scenarios that could happen with your partners? Wouldn't it be better just to have the most amazing DR and BC plan? Yes, it would be. But I think in this case, that's a very difficult thing to do, even if you had a disaster recovery business continuity plan for, you know, all of your endpoints, you know, in this case, most likely those endpoints come right back up and download the latest files from CrowdStrike and just blue screen right away. Personally, th this isn't a CrowdStrike problem. This is a concentration problem across a lot of the people that we call our core vendors and whether that's Microsoft Office 365, a CRM tool, an HR tool, a lot of these things, AWS for that matter. What happened to everybody when US East One went down, you know, a couple of years ago? We have to have better expectations from our vendors about, you know, their resilience plans. And to the point that was made in the, the panel prior to, to this podcast, we need to have strong strategies for rolling out the latest versions of software. You know, I was talking to to someone who is at a, a pretty significant enterprise, I won't say which, but they said, you know, we're, we're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If we don't take the latest version of CrowdStrike all the time, then we're creating a window for attackers to get into our environment. And if we do take the latest version of CrowdStrike all the time, then this is what can happen. So which one do you choose, right? And it's a calculated risk, hoping that a vendor like CrowdStrike is going to test very, very thoroughly and not have something like this happen. Well, and I think that's, my guess would be not so much a 50-50 choice because CrowdStrike is trying to do the right thing. 
unlike the criminals who are trying to take advantage of the window. Eduardo? Yeah, I, and I agree with Adam here. In our case, we don't use CrowdStrike, but we took the time to, how can we learn from this, right? One of the things that, that really resonated with us was the BitLocker keys issues, right? We never thought about that. So what we're doing now, we're removing that to a non-Windows environment, have it locked up, just in case we have to recover, we don't rely on the same environment, right? Like we took some lessons learned from that one, you know, make sure we're logging down our domain controllers the right way. Actually engaging with some of our vendors as it goes to change management and how do we schedule those changes? As Adam said, are we willing to wait two weeks, one week? Do we want to be on the second series of, of changes? Those are conversations that we need to have with our vendors and, and be sure that we communicate that to the business as well, just to make clear that, hey, we're taking this risk, but it's because there's a bigger risk. And I, every my CFO called me next morning, hey, are we safe? He's like, yeah, we don't use CrowdStrike. And that's how much they care about what we use. But we explain, okay, so what are we going to do about it? Okay, we don't have to do anything about it, but we're going to learn from it. And, and that's how we are approaching this case. Who's our sponsor this week? We have one more phenomenal sponsor, and that is Fortra. So let me introduce you to Fortra Data Protection Security Solutions, an industry standard in safeguarding your data. Fortra's advanced solutions are engineered to not only protect your data, but also to empower your security teams with intelligent, efficient tools. These interwoven tools, such as industry-recognized names like Digital Guardian DLP, are proactive, predictive, and designed to enhance your security landscape. Consider a security system that integrates effortlessly with your current infrastructure, offering real-time threat detection and automated response capabilities. From preventing data leaks to managing insider threats and ensuring compliance across various platforms, Fortra provides robust defense mechanisms. Over 30,000 organizations worldwide rely on Fortra for their critical data protection. It's time for your organization to transform security challenges into opportunities. Visit Fortra.com, that's F-O-R-T-R-A.com, to discover how Fortra can help you secure your data with unmatched precision and expertise. It's time for the audience question speed round. I hold in my hand here a series of questions that I ask many of you who are actually in this room right now and many who are not in this room. Uh, question for both you, Eduardo and Adam. And with the little time that we have left today, I'm going to ask you as many as we can get through. So don't spend too much time on this. But this one refers to the question we were doing about the psychology. And uh, I'll start with you, Eduardo. Just as quick as you can answer, because I know we could do a whole segment on each one of these. Does the buck always stop with the CISO? If you educated your staff about shadow IT or, or phishing, whatever, and they still made the mistake, does the, the problem always bubble up to you and you still have to manage it? Or is it a, you know, hey, one person can't do all the security, can't always blame the CISO? And oh, by the way, I want to quote, this is Stephen Dye from Uplift Cyber. So it, it, it does stop with the CISO if the CISO has communicated risk and has assumed the risk the right way. We have a process of who's owning that risk. If I don't have controls or I don't have the server shadow IT or, or anything that a, a new application that got developed, we didn't know about it, it got hacked, it, there's a big breach. Okay, do I own the risk? No, but if I own the risk and that's something that we're, we're constantly doing, yeah, it's going to stop with me because I, I need to put the right controls in place. It depends on who owns the risk at that point. All right. Do you want to answer this or we go to the next one? You tell me. Same question. Sure. I think yes and no. I think security is everybody's responsibility in the organization, but it's ultimately the CISO's accountability to make sure that everybody in the organization understands their part. All right. Next question. What in anyone's security program, and where you know all cybersecurity professionals, CISOs are building out a security program, is there an element of it though you're concerned about with regard to that a cyber insurance policy won't pay out? And this comes from Daniel Polomeni of GuidePoint Security. I don't love the 
act of war clauses in cyber insurance policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that can be stretched a long way, given what nation state actors are doing and can do that can have a, a huge impact worldwide. And, you know, enterprises can be collateral damage as a result of that. And if insurance companies won't pay out based on that clause, that could be an issue. And also hard to identify if it is. For sure. Yeah, and that leads yourself to interpretation at that point. That's one of the ones that we, we've been fighting for a while. And the other one, it's kind of like the selection. If I have an incident and I need an incident response provider or a forensics, sometimes you get forced to do the services with a specific provider. We've been fighting that one because we, we have our providers and they work fine. It, it, it's, it's a point of contention at that point. All right. Uh, I like this question from Tim Krabeck of Scripps Research. You know, you hear the classic line of, you know, what's keeping you up at night? So my question for you is, is there stuff keeping your staff up at night? And if so, how do you prevent that? Like, you don't want them stressing out. I hope not. Like, do you do anything? Or, I mean, is there something specific? I mean, there's tons of problems, but what do you do to prevent them stressing out? I think, I think we focus on reminding them that We've got great people, great process. We test continuously. We're doing everything that we can to stay ahead of attackers. But at the end of the day, it's, it is a 24-7 job. They don't have to stay awake at night thinking about it because, you know, we've, we've done everything that we could do, but there's still risk there. It, it's a communication problem, right? Like if we don't communicate be totally transparent with our teams, they become stressed about issues that might not be even issues or they might not exist, right? That's a good point. I have found out that something was just poor communication. They got stressed about it. And my attitude is, oh, that's no big deal. Exactly. And, and, and it happens. To, listen, in our case, I have six different business units. One of them, it's in, in the Hong Kong PRC area. And, and the communication... It's not always, you know, it's, it's a video call, right? So there's a lot of, 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 of communication barriers, but I was stressing out about myself issues, and they were fine at the All end. All right. I wanna, we're running just a hair over, but I want to get through these two quick ones. Let's see if we can get through. When eva I love this question. It's from Troiano Frank of Darktrace. When evaluating a tool, how do you want the vendor's tool to best support your team? So you're evaluating the tool. And it, you, one of the parts of evaluation is I want my team to experience this, be able to do this. It works this way. Like, what is it that the team needs that support from the tool? I think one of the most underrated elements of conducting a, a proof of concept or a proof of value with new technology is thinking about how it's going to be operationalized long term. Right. So I think what could be done better by vendors during POCs is to not think, OK, does the product do what it's supposed to do in this very controlled environment with the help of, you know, a solutions architect or a sales engineer working side by side with with my team? But think about, OK, once this is fully deployed, what is the operational impact and how much overhead is there going to be? And can we show the team that this is actually going to make their lives incrementally better? It's going to reduce the amount of work ultimately that they have to do, prevent them from staying awake at night, and, and other things. 100% agree. If we have the same issue. If, if, if we communicate with the vendor and give them the right requirements, our team evaluates. We, listen, for IAM, we evaluated over 25 vendors We to pick one. But... The whole team picked it, and the whole business picked it. So it, it, it was a long process, but it, now everyone loves it. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. I want to thank our sponsors. That would be Savvy Security, Quadrant Information Security, and Fortra. Please go visit our sponsors. I want to throw get, let you guys have the very last word here. Anything last you'd like to say, and uh, are either of you hiring? So I want to thank you for having us here, and I want to thank all the live audience here as well. This is a, a bucket list item for me, so thank you very much, David. Eduardo stepping in. That was awesome. Yeah, I've been a long-time listener of the podcast. 
We we are hiring, but only in two of our six business units, which is EMEA and the Hong Kong PRC area. And you so. have to be there. But we have listeners in those areas. All right, Adam. Thank, thank you for having me uh, once again. Uh, we are we, we will have intern positions for next summer opening up. Oh, excellent. That very much speaks to this audience that's right here. Well, thank you very much, audience. We greatly appreciate you supporting and listening to the CISO Series podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. We have lots more shows on our website, CISOseries.com. Please join us on Fridays for our live shows, Super Cyber Friday, our virtual meetup, and Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. This show thrives on your input. Go to the Participate menu on our site for plenty of ways to get involved, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Series podcast. 